I thought what we we the subject I'd like to try to talk to you about is language more than anything else, and and um, language and history, um, because some of the pieces that we've got on the website, five of the shortlisted pieces, um, the, the France's Secret War piece was um, one that was particularly powerful. Um, the multiculturalism um, piece, how multiculturalism is portraying women. You wrote a lot about multiculturalism, but this is one about uh, women in court decisions in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, the um, uh, visit of King Abdullah. Um, yep. the, um, uh, James Maxton, which I thought was a particularly interesting uh, dramatization of an obscure uh, historical character, um, and uh, your your wonderful holiday on the oh ship. God, with I the still have the night. The National yeah. Review, yes, <laughs> which I thought was one of the funniest pieces I've read in a long time. Oh, about, thank um, you. But um, uh, th throughout throughout the whole. Piece, th through this and other pieces that you've written, there's a, there's a real feel for a voice, for, for language, for a rhythm, for I, um, uh, and not just English. Um, and I, I wonder where that came from. Where, where is the, um, where, where is the, what languages do you have? I speak very bad German and very bad French. My father is Swiss German, uh, and my mother is Scottish. So um, I think. One of the things that affects your voice, I was thinking about this recently, I think, actually, is that I grew up in a place that neither of my parents were from. I grew up in London, and my mother was Scottish, and my, my dad was Swiss German, and my father has a, a habit of refusing to speak English when he's in a bad mood, um, which is fine if, you know, in certain positions, but when you're a bus driver, that can cause a few problems, you know. But the, the, so I think one of the ways you become aware of language is I was very conscious that where I grew up, people were not speaking like my parents. And I think you get a sense of the, the kind of strange sinews of language. And I grew up in a place where people spoke a lot of different languages. I grew up in North London, so there were a lot of people who spoke Urdu or, or various languages from the Indian subcontinent. Uh, there were a lot of people, it was a big Jewish community, so there were a lot of people who spoke. Uh, I've always loved Yiddish words. I always wanted to learn Yiddish, but it seems like the most useless language to learn, but, but I just love the sound of it. Um, so I think it was partly growing up in a place where there were so many different languages being spoken. And, and knowing that I, I couldn't speak like my parents. You know, I, I, I would have been bizarre if you had a Glaswegian accent or a Swiss German accent in, in Edgware in North London. But it worked beautifully when uh, you were, when you were uh, um, dreaming up the Maxton character and uh, uh, speaking with a perfect Scottish accent. That's my mum's voice. <laughs> my mother is a, a militant Glaswegian. We have many, uh, she's, uh, we have rows occasionally about Scottish nationalism, but she's, yeah, so she, that's her voice, really, that I use for James Maxton. I should explain to you that James Maxton is um, Gordon Brown's hero. He, he, Brown wrote a uh, really interesting biography of him when he was in his 20s, it was his PhD thesis. James Maxton was this, this strange... I think Gordon Brown's relationship to James Maxton reveals so much about him. Anyone who wants to understand Gordon Brown should really read that book. He, and he said that Maxton was his hero, he even modelled his looks on Maxton when he was a young man. Maxton was a... a Born to middle class Scottish parents, uh, just outside, not far from Glasgow, like like Brown being born in Fife to you know uh, what would then have been considered middle class you know, vicar. And Maxton, when he was quite young, became very aware of poverty and the poverty in Scotland. You know, there was a lot of tuberculosis. There was a lot. Of, this is the time when when my grandmother was a child. There was tuberculosis in in that part of Scotland. There was tuberc growing up in the tenements. There was tuberculosis. There was rickets. And uh, he, he taught poor kids and was just outraged by, by the inequality that he saw and by the inequality of life chances, and it repulsed him. And you really see that when you read his, his work. I think nobody except Nye Bevan communicates so well that rage at just wasting people's lives, just wasting people with poverty, you know, that these, these kids who could have done so much just being thrown away because they didn't have really basic things that other people had. So how did you come across Maxton? How did you? How did you? Was this in in in, in reporting on Brown or? In yeah, I think I I think I. I think I just read the book. I was interested in reading all of Brown's books because Brown's written a few books. Uh, he wrote quite a good book called that, "Let There Be Greed: A Critique of Thatcherism" in, in 1987. So, I was interested in looking at that. 
But the way Brown, it's fascinating because you can see when Brown is describing Maxine, he's describing his idealised vision of himself. Mm. And it's fascinating, he talks a lot about middle class guilt, which I thought was fascinating. He says about Maxton, but obviously talking partly about himself, he felt guilty when he had something other people didn't have, he was driven by that. Um, and I think you really get the... But, but what's fascinating about Maxton is not just Brown's sympathy for him, but also where Brown is critical of him. Because what Brown sees is, you have all this shimmering brilliance in Maxton. He was uh, extraordinarily intelligent, he was an amazing wordsmith, he was uh, extraordinarily passionate and sincere, and he didn't achieve anything. But you didn't come. You didn't come to that column. Uh, you didn't write that column, waiting for an opportunity to publish it. Um, you must have written that in the in, a, um, uh, in this period when there was the the uh, the, the march to to um, victory against no opposition that uh, Brown was going through for that six week period. Uh, yeah, I think I wrote it during that period, yeah. and it was. But what was fascinating is it was Brown was about to win, and you could see that dilemma that Brown simultaneously loving Maxton, but also seeing that it didn't come to anything. And re seeing Brown in the process of making all the ugly compromises you have to make to become Prime Minister of any country anywhere, and you know, saying some really quite ugly things, and sucking up to some quite ugly people. And obviously some of Brown's disagreements with Maxton are sincere. Maxton was a, a, a socialist in the sense of nationalising pretty much everything democratically, whereas Brown obviously doesn't genuinely and sincerely doesn't believe in that. But a lot of the other stuff is just kind of ugly compromises that you have to make. And I think with Brown you really see with Brown's engagement with Maxton, you really see the big dilemma for anyone who's left wing. Do you retain your purity, describe everything honestly and criticize and risk being impotent? Or do you make all those compromises and risk just becoming so corrupted that you're not achieve you forget what you were there for or you can't achieve the things you were there for? And it's only because you, Brown has, has achieved some of the things Maxton wanted. You know, Maxton called for minimum wage. Maxton called Winston Churchill a murderer for taking away free milk from kids. Brown has restored that. Uh, so there's, there's and as you said in that piece, and given them fruit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, the, the, the and that you know that's that that's really something. You know, and that. Uh, Often the best of the current government you see in the very small things they've done. You and the worst, you know, we can. Uh, it doesn't really need much summary, you know. But the 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 best things. But again, you know, as Maxton would have said to him, was it worth it? You know, was it worth all the things you vote for and all the horrific things you've supported? What comfort is it to 650,000 dead Iraqis to tell them that 800,000 people have been lived out of poverty in Britain? You but know? that was your thought. Yeah. Which was which was an interesting. Uh, it, it was interesting that you, uh, you, you're not at all shy about um, uh, um, putting into the middle of, of your reporting and your analysis, uh, imagining um, your um, strong feelings about uh, the, the subjects you're writing. Yeah, I think columns, I think newspaper columns, the newspaper, well, not necessarily, but the newspaper columnists I like, and the ones that really influenced me were ones that weren't afraid of using their own voice. I can't stand columnists that are just kind of you know, why oh why, you know, just shooting from the hip knee joke reactions to things. But, and I think that's what, that's the worst of personal columnists that people think of. But if you look at uh, who I think of as the kind of best columnists, people like George Monbiot or Polly Toynbee or, or Christopher Hitchens at his best, they, they use a personal voice to express facts and research and explain things. I tend not to absorb information. One of the things like, I tend not to absorb information in a kind of, um, uh, kind of gloopy, facty way. I tend to latch onto arguments and then try to assess evidence through arguments. I think we all think like that, really. We, we can pretend we don't, but we all filter information according to how we think and try to shape it in those ways, and then you think, oh, well, is this fact in, in, incongruent with what I think? And it's when you get that grit of an inconvenient fact, a fact that doesn't fit with your, your preconceptions, that it becomes interesting and, and so on. But no, I think... I think the columnists I admire are ones that do that, that marshal facts in the, in the context of an argument. 